this merely to share with you some of the insight of the success that I think uh, which our Malaysia uh, currently after the COVID, I'm sure I'm sure there is a lot of questions about infection disease and uh, COVID uh, associated with sepsis. I think there's a lot of confusions that we need to carry out. So, but however, I would just like to share with you um, some of the basic um, concept of uh, management of sepsis. And because of sepsis is so uh, unpredictable, so um, that's why we put a word called personalizing, uh, personalized management in sepsis is more appropriate for sepsis. So um, this slide, this slide actually I summarize the whole sepsis evolution, the history of sepsis, how it comes to come to today's um, our medical book. So um, actually, we started on 1970. Um, it at that time the advanced ICU technology. Um, so they, uh, we start to pick up uh, sepsis syndrome. Actually, is a group of uh, disease that uh, actually can be treated and can be reversed hundred percent. So um, actually, this disease um, was that um, if we promptly treat, actually um, there is a chance that patient back to the uh, previous uh, comorbid meanings that he can be uh, completely healthy. So in 1918, uh, the concept of multi-organ failure was uh, introduced. That time, the SOFA score. SOFA score was um, introduced by uh, our Professor J. R. Vincent. And now, uh, because of uh, there is an increase of the uh, sepsis uh, incident, so 1992, they decided to sit together and come up with the sepsis one definition for sepsis, severe sepsis, and sepsis shock definition. So this is, was published in two, uh, 1991. And uh, they revisit again the definition on uh, uh, 2002, which uh, the sepsis two was seen but they define more details about the organ failure system. However, last 2016, this whole group of uh, uh, intensive care uh, specialists sit with, together with emergency physician and also infection disease uh, physician. They found out that um, they, they agree on sepsis definition one and sepsis definition two is uh, too sensitive and they include too many patients into the uh, statistic, whereby it's not realistic. And also, uh, there is a chances that a patient who has sepsis syndrome, meaning that the fever presented with all the search criteria, may be discharged immediately from the emergency department. So the sepsis doesn't reflect the severity. Uh, the definition of sepsis one and two didn't reflect the severity of the sepsis. So currently, they define again the sepsis three, which is the sepsis and only septic shock. So the current sepsis, uh, sepsis actually is the is uh, the previous severe sepsis. However, the septic shock now, they added another uh, condition whereby lactics must be more than two. But uh, in our limited uh, resources country like Malaysia, not all hospitals have lactic level. And all not other, other countries have lactic level in our emergency department as well as even in the ward. So um, um, there is a problem that uh, to apply this definition, definitely we try our best to uh, fulfill the minimum criteria. But however, we need to adjust a bit in our setting. You see, in 1992, there is also some syndrome for uh, inflammation such as SERS criteria, some is CAS criteria and MAS criteria. This was, uh, I, will ex I have already explained last, uh, our last um, webinar. And maybe you can go back to the YouTube uh, I have already posted uh, previously. And so, uh, and also 2016, uh, due to uh, the current, uh, our current definition of such three is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by host dysregulated response due to infection. So the main point of here is life-threatening organ dysfunction. However, we need to systematically um, uh, systematically score or objectively assess this organ dysfunction uh, present. So we introduce a new scoring called QSOFA score and also reintroduce again the SOFA score, which is already uh, uh, mentioned during 1980s. Yeah? And also, there is also introducing of a PIC syndrome, whereby uh, persist, uh, this is called uh, persistent inflammatory immunosuppressed syndrome, uh, catabolic syndrome. It happens when advancement of ICU technology um, more um, more advanced, and a patient support life is life support is so good that a patient can uh, become PIC syndrome. Later on, I will explain a bit what is this syndrome. So I make it a very diagrammatic uh, way of approach to definition of sepsis. It make it easy for you. So all the patients with uh, infections, infections, suspected infection or confirmed infection, either from bacteria, fungus, prion, uh, viral or parasite, then we have to look into assess for the organ failure. The organ failure, we can use these three tools, 
which is the Q so far, which is kind of just now I talked about the three criteria, and also the SOFA score, whereby this SOFA score is already well known in ICU, uh, or other scoring like Apache score or new score, whereby uh, was, uh, this SOFA score was introduced by uh, our success tree uh, panel. And I, I would like to introduce another score, which is the modified SOFA score, which is more suitable for our uh, limited and uh, moder uh, limited uh, resources setting, like Malaysia or other countries, we have uh, no sophisticated um, funding or resources. Yeah. So later on, I will look into this uh, dysregulated whole response. Um, dysregulated whole response was introduced during the success one and two, whereby the search criteria was overly popular. Yeah. But however, actually, there is other side of the inflammation is uh, inflammations. Um, uh, spectrum which is cast the patient in hibernate or not respond to any inflammation and mass a mixture of both cyst and cast as far as pig syndrome whereby if a patient have illness more than 14 days and persistently ill but there's no response to inflammation patient can go into the uh, pig syndrome patient actually in this state is immunocompromised so what is QSOFA? QSOFA consists of three criteria which is the hypotension and Hypotension, systolic BP less than 100, and altered mental status, which is GCS less than 15, and also tachycardic, which is uh, respiratory rate more than 22. Either two of these criteria positive, we consider patient have organ failure. But however, if this is not more than two, we cannot rule out any organ failure. Yeah? So uh, this skill so far only can use outside in outside ICU setting. For ICU setting, we cannot use this because it, it was this three vital sign was augmented by ventilation and also the inotrope. So the specificity and sensitivity is reduced in ICU. Uh, we suggest uh, the, our, our ICU uh, friends, uh, intensivists, uh, use back the sequelae organ failure assessment score, which is the SOFA score, traditional SOFA score, which consists of six criteria, uh, respiratory, respiratory, coagulation of platelet, liver, cardiovascular, CNS, and renal. This scoring needs uh, four, four lab laboratory uh, investigation and two clinical uh, assessment. So for a very busy and very um, limited resources setting, this is very, not very conducive to be scored. Any score more than two consider patient have a sepsis related organ dysfunction and which is considered as a sepsis if present of infection. So uh, let me introduce one of the, the other one, which is a uh, modified SOFA score, modified sequential organ dysfunction score. It consists of five criteria only, five organ only, and the scoring is almost the same system. However, they only need three clinicals, uh, sorry, four clinicals uh, parameters and one laboratory parameters, which is easily available in any setting. So um, uh, for the respiratory rate, what is the difference? Respiratory for the SOFA score is using PaO2 and FI2. means you need an ABG and you need a liver function test. And we need a platelet from FBC and we need a renal profile from the, uh, for creatinine. However, for modified SOFA score, we no need any ABG. We just need a SpO2 and estimate FiO2 under room air or under the desoprong or under high flow mass. Liver, we just need to look into jaundice or non-jaundice. Uh, and cardiovascular, we only need to look into the BP. GCS can be scaled, scored by our periphery and also renal creatinine, which is from our blood test. Uh, this, I think, all settings can get this information very, very simple. Yeah. Uh, this is a chart that I, I had modified and so that uh, this chart can be printed out and put into all the patients in uh, our, our setting, especially uh, you can in, use it in the medical ward, surgical ward, uh, for uh, even emergency department. And you just need to do it just circle which is a criteria that's suitable to your patient and we score back after six hours when you had uh, resuscitate the patient and see the score have reduced or you can see the progress of the patient each organ yeah and we can also know that our management is tally or not and targeted to the re restoration of all this organ failure in the right track or not so why why we need to have a personalized uh, success treatment actually if you go into sepsis, actually there's a big spectrum of sepsis that we, uh, we uh, really don't understand about. So because different individuals have different type of whole dysregulated state, I think everybody know that uh, during this COVID time, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I think a lot of uh, webinar have already mentioned about um, uh, very difficult to predict uh, uh, COVID uh, inflammation state. 
actually patients sepsis, septic patient, um, their organ failure is due to their whole dysregulation, meaning that the inflammation is too much or too low that cause the patients, uh, uh, lead to the patient mortality outcome. And also presented with other type of organ failure also will contribute to the mortality. The more organ failure, the more patient will uh, have a chance of uh, heart, uh, death. As well as, that is also interesting uh, to mention about the gender different. Female and male have a different type of uh, inflammation state as well as phenotype, meaning that I, based on races or based on geographical, and also there is heterogeneous background of comorbid and also the financial, the status of the uh, country. It's a high in, un, income country, in low income country can affect this. Yeah. So we, because of our curiosity, we had uh, done our own, uh, our, we produced a paper which is a systemic review and meta-analysis on this, uh, this matter to see whether our sepsis, uh, the different races and different type of uh, setting will give a different type of uh, organ failure rate and also mortality which we found out that uh, different geographical area have different uh, organ failure out ratio, meaning that the, the, if they have a so Q so far, and we use Q so far as a tool to mention the measure the organ failure. Uh, when Africans are friends, uh, actually they have a Q so far more than two, the out ratio of getting uh, mortality is 8.4. For the Central America, European and Oceania, the uh, odd ratio of mortality using SOFA score more than two is about five four. This is significant different. And also Asian, the odd ratio is so low, uh, which is three point five. And we found that this hetero we found that our study uh, the, there is moderate heterogeneity of um, different geographicals and different phenotype of uh, background, meaning that the races can have a different response in the sepsis uh, pertaining to the inflammations of uh, the uh, na the nature of the inflammation. And cause organ failure. We can see our colored friend have a higher mortality on the uh, organ failure, and our Caucasian friends and also Middle East have a moderate uh, uh, mortality, as well as the Asian have a lower mortality because of lower organ failure. So this is uh, quite a very shocking new uh, shocking finding for us, and I uh, feel that this is something that we need to look into. So this is our meta analysis. This is uh, uh, the odd ratio. Actually, there is heterogeneity. Even uh, latest 2019, the group of uh, sepsis three scientists, uh, which is uh, Seymour at all, Seymour Professor Seymour, actually he had also told us that they found out that there is four type of phenotype: alpha, beta, gamma, and also delta type of um, sepsis patient. We, we remember uh, during the early go directed therapy era, early of uh, 2000. Pam, everybody was uh, so happy that uh, the uh, our professor Rivel at all had already uh, said that they can reduce mortality from forty percent up uh, down to eighteen percent using the early go directed therapy uh, protocol. However, currently a lot of people saying that the early go directed therapy was not useful. Actually, that is a reason why. Uh, if if based on this four phenotype of uh, sepsis only. Only the alpha phenotype is benefit for early go directed therapy. The early go directed therapy, uh, alpha phenotype actually is more to the youngster, normal adult without any comorbid. They are healthy. They have no hyperinflammation. They have no hyperinflammation. However, beta group is older, older population which is not benefit. And the, alpha, uh, the gamma type, which is the hyperinflammation, hyperinflammation type, and also got uh, ARDS. Uh, and also the delta, uh, the delta phenotype, which have a really pre-existing liver failure and always have septic shock. This three group was not benefit for emergency, uh, for ericodynamic therapy. So that's why, um, uh, based on this also, I would like to share with you, this is some of the insight on sepsis inflammation response. Um, you can have a look on this chart, very simple chart. This is the timeline, days, when the patient who have encountered infection. Yeah, encountered infection. So what happened is that when we had infection, we will follow a curve in this way to produce inflammation. So our inflammation will be hyperinflammation. And if you go down here, it's hypoinflammation, meaning that there's no inflammation. So the hyperinflammation will get, uh, will get more higher and higher for day one or day two or day three. Uh, in a normal curve, in a normal person who have normal inflammation, it should have reduced after the pathogen will clear out and the, the inflammation will come down to normal, or they will go back to the baseline, or they will have overshoot a bit in the state of hypoinflammation a bit, and then go back, we call it a cast, or 
we had a very poor nutrition patient, maybe, uh, maybe they are like elderly, they couldn't uh, fight the pathogen and they didn't seek for help. And then they will go down to this light, this list line, and then they become a high, very, very hypo inflammation. And now other chances of nosocomial and viral re reactivation will come in and cause a complication late, uh, late date. And also there is a, this is called a sepsis late, uh, late date. This is called the early that this early death, how it happens is when our inflammation is too much, hyperinflammation patient, they will have a very early organ failure. It's like our dengue critical phase, our, our COVID. Uh, if they have hyperinflammation, the vessel, the vascular leakage is very high due to the cytokine storm. The cytokine storm can destroy our organ and cause early death. So how to predict this early death and how to predict this late death? Now, I would like to share with you some of the insight that I understand about our inflammation and according to genotype and phenotype as well as gender. From this chart, as like I have simplified this chart, uh, this chart is more a bit complicated compared with just now. So what happened is that from our, based on our study, based on all the, our meta-analysis, based on all the research, we found out that our colored friends, our colored skin friends, which is uh, more to the Africans uh, descendants, they have more uh, protein uh, combination in the body and they are tend to have more inflammation when they have infection and for compared with our Caucasian friend they also have a good uh, good in uh, muscle bulk however they have more reserve on the fact that they can uh, fight the war longer for the Asian country friend, our friend here we had a uh, we have a less protein but less fat that we usually um, not reacted too much toward infection the inflammation will be just gentle. However, if we have um, uh, we have to support with a lot of nutrition so that we can prolong our our sepsis uh, sequelae. So what happened is that when uh, I put it very simple is that when our uh, dear colored friends when they are very hard to have infections because they have very strong immunity. However, when they have infection, they will deteriorate very fast and they tend to have hyperinflammation and they get into uh, early death. However, for our Caucasian friends, they also have a very good muscle bulk and they can have a very hyperinflammation. It's like our COVID now, you can see our Europe friends. They will have a lot, a lot of um, in, uh, inflammation due to our cytokine storm. However, because the body composition has more fat compared with our uh, colored friends, they have... Um, they can fight a longer war uh, and they can survive longer, all right? And come to the Asian, we are, we are easily get infection and easily get sepsis. How, no, sorry, in, easily get infection. However, our sepsis rate is a bit low because our inflammation would not mount until so high that we cause organ failure. However, if we go into organ failure, our, our, our body will not last longer than uh, anywhere else because we have less fat compared with that. So the immunity and inflammation actually based on our body composition of protein. Body uh, our body combo, uh, and in another way, uh, sorry, in another word is the muscle bulk. Yeah? So male and female, what's the difference? Male definitely have more muscle bulk compared with the female. That's why male have usually if infection, they will come become early to hospital faster because they have more cytokine storm. They have more cytokine to produce, more cytokine patient body will be more painful and then they will be more ill and they look toxic compared with lady. Lady have more fat composition uh, compared with uh, male and they will have a softer and very um, very nice inflammation. That's why they can come a bit late and they can take care of the hair because they are a survivor. Lady is always the survivor for all. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks to Mother <laughs> Earth. Yeah? So, um, so what I want to say is that uh, there is a difference between the female and male and also the races that you have to put in the account to predict whether the patient comes in hyperinflammation or hyperinflammation state. As well as the age, the higher age group, the lower age group, extreme ages group will have a lower or high, higher inflammation. For the adult with the normal age, they actually have a normal inflammation. Okay, um, let me show with you. Sorry, I, I will go for the previous slide first. Okay, here, uh, you can see here, the hyperinflammation group Hyperinflammation group is this group and young male and the hyperinflammation group is more to the blue line here. They are not too bad. They are all the black line, which is they follow the normal hemostasis. The blue color 
zone is homostatic, uh, meaning that the normal inflammatory homostasis. However, if you cross the blue line, the red color actually is telling you that patient having a sepsis, patient having a cytokine storm, and from here, patient is start to uh, start to hypoinflammation, meaning the patient exhausted. And then if you support with all the in, uh, antibiotic, you support with management, patient can recover. However, if not supported, patient will go into immune compromise and MOD dead, black dead. Yeah? So uh, a simple way to describe this is that um, when we have a normal inflammation um, response, we will go into the green color curve, no problem, we will recover soon. However, for those who have uh, a bit of more inflammation, uh, maybe they will go into this sepsis curve, yeah, higher inflammation. And this higher inflammation can be resolved by maybe uh, some of our own, own, uh, our own immunity, maybe patient takes some medication that reduce this and then patient survive. However, if unfortunately the person between the one week, within a few days, they get another infection again. So they will trigger another time of uh, uh, cytokine storm. And this, if this continuously have multiple infections in the long run, patient will go into this stage called PICS. It's an inflammation, uh, we call it inflammation. A patient go into hibernation, like uh, immunocompromised state, catabolic state, patient cannot mount any inflammation well. Uh, patient is in hibernation to, to prolong their life. Yeah? However, if those who are less immunity or less uh, inflammation, uh, but because of the infection is prolonged and not really taken care of, patient can go into a mass phase. Mass phase can be a mixture of the SERS and ZOCAS and also later on become CAS phase. CAS phase is the way, is why, why we have this CAS phase. Our body is very uh, interesting. Um, for, when we have infection, we need inflammation to, and also in, uh, immunity uh, and also inert, uh, our cell inert immune response, our adaptive immune response and our inflammation to uh, buffer the antigen, yeah? However, when we go into one point whereby we know that we are losing the war and we couldn't fight the pathogen, our body will turn into a hibernation state, meaning that the body will tell itself, oh, I cannot, I couldn't uh, fight anymore. I should reserve the resort, I, can res I should reserve my whatever resources inside the body to prolong my life. So I will shut down my immune system so that I didn't fight back so that I can prolong, use slowly my resources to prolong my life. So this is called the CAS phase, yeah? compensated, compensated anti-inflammatory response syndrome. Patient will come in with very hypo, hypo, hypothermia, hypoglycemic, and very, very ill. Uh? And the, the, the hormone of CAS actually is cold, patient very cold. You can see the temperature is less than 36. Eh? Compared with SIRS, SIRS can be 36, 38, but they have inflammation. However, CAS is very specific. They have very, very low temperature and also very, very low uh, our uh, immunity. Yeah? Okay, but if this three stage was not resolved and then we supported the patient without taking care of the pathogen or patient have nosocromal infection here and prolong until up to 14 days, patient will enter into the peak phase, which is called persistent in, uh, immunocompromised Inflammation, uh, inflammation catabolic state. Yeah? This state, actually patient was totally uh, let go the inflammation and in, uh, patient have no immunity, adaptive, even uh, the inert one to counter the, uh, our pathogen. And this patient will be prolonged by our support, ICU support, prolonged by our, our support without uh, taking care of the pathogen. And this will go on, go on, go on until the patient pass away. Okay. So recently, there is a two guidelines uh, was uh, come up uh, was introduced, which is two thousand sixteen. Uh, the survival success campaign have updated in two thousand sixteen, whereby it consists of seventy eight pages uh, of the protocol and recommendation. However, it's hard to follow. That's why I think they come out a very simple bundle for us two thousand eighteen that consists of five steps only. So this is the things that I want to share with you the two thousand eighteen update. Yeah. So the 2018 uh, update, they had uh, introduced the Hour One Bundle. Hour One, Hour One Bundle, as as you said, is 2018. Uh, they want to why they want to do uh, okay. The Hour One Bundle actually consists of five steps: one, two, three, four, five. So the first recommendation is that you need to measure the lactate level. If the lactate level more than two, then we need to initiate the whole bundle. So patient need to start antibiotic within the one within forty five minutes of upon diagnosis of sepsis, which is uh, 
uh, you have to take a blood culture before you give the antibiotic. Uh, we suggest an uh, empirical antibiotic. And also, now we want to give the antibiotic straight away. And also, we begin to administrate it for 30 ml of crystalloid for those who have hypotension or let it more than four. And after that, we consider the vasopressor yeah, for patients who have hypotension. So this is the roughly, uh, there's a recommendation from red lactic, it's weak recommendation, low quality evidence. Obtain blood culture is just a best practice statement. Administration of broad-spectrum uh, broad antibiotic is strong. It's a very strong recommendation. So this will improve the patient's survival. Antibiotic is very important for a patient who have bacterial infection. However, for those growth with viral, those growth of fungal, there's not yet any recommendation yet. And also rapid, uh, rapid crystalloid 30 ml per kilo is for the patient who have hypotension and lactic more than four. This is very, very strong uh, recommendation. And also apply of vasopressor if the patient BP lower than 30, 65 after adequate fluid in substitution. It's after or during, yeah? Strong recommendation, moderate quality. So now, how we incorporate all this into a more systematic uh, sepsis management because there is so many things that we need to understand and so many things that we need to take care, take care of. So I suggest of a very simple basic concept on approach on sepsis. So first of all, you need to understand how to define sepsis and you have to quickly identify sepsis in the different settings. So using the QSOFA score, the MSOFA score, and determine the stage of the inflammation of the sepsis, which is to determine the state of surf, cars, mass or pigs. This is very important because uh, later on, the medication that we want to use will be very different from each state, yeah? And the concept is different. And also suggest to obtain some of the biomarkers for help, to help us to determine and monitor, monitor the sepsis outcome. If let's say your hospital have this, if they, you don't have that later on for the next, um, for the next, uh, next, uh, next talk, I will share with you other mortality, mortality and more easier, yeah? And management initial management why we have to initiate the our one bundle. Our one bundle is that do all this our one bundle. Later on, we'll go into a personalized therapy, which is I will introduce you a concept on septic shock resuscitation, which consists of six steps. Yeah, we have to look into these six things. The volume, volume is more to stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, the tone, cardiac contractility, the cardiac function, oxygen delivery exchange, the hormone and steroids, as well as ATP, glucose, and nutrition. Yeah? So this is a simplified uh, chart that I want to propose to you. Uh, so you look into this small little uh, group. Yeah? This is six things that I put together. And this three part is all about systemic res uh, resuscitation. And this part will be cellular resuscitation. Yeah? I will talk about cellular resuscitation more because uh, because of cellular failure lead to systemic failure. That's why, but however, approach to the patient, usually we will approach to systemic resuscitation, then only later on we go back to fundamental resuscitation of cellular. What is so important about this? You see, the stroke volume, systemic vascular resistance, cardiac contractility, is, it, it, it actually gives us uh, information. Uh, we can obtain the information from our blood pressure, the vital sign, yeah? However, for this part, we need to have investigation like uh, blood tests, all these things. But this is usually was not really taken care of. That's why patients keep on after you resuscitate the patient, BP chante, BP nicely. However, one hour later, two hours later, BP crash again. Have you, have you seen this type of situation before? Uh, you have well resuscitated patient and then two or three hours later, patient stable and put in to an observation part or ward or whatever and rest for a while and the patient suddenly collapse again because we oversee this part of our resuscitation. We need to go for the heart fundamental resuscitation. So our one bundle, why is recommended? Because, because previously, remember, when World War I, World War II, when patient was labelled as sepsis, they are really ill. However, after sepsis 1, sepsis 2 definition come up, sepsis actually not so ill. Patient can walk around, patient can go to bring uh, our outpatient to see, and the patient can discharge like simple tonsillitis also can have sepsis because of the criteria, the definition. So after they re after they reintroduce the sepsis three in, um, uh, definition, uh, it reflects the clinical reality of sepsis seriousness. That's why when you reflect the if you have a more serious case, then you need to have a more uh, urgent plan to manage the patient. So the urgent plan from three hour bundle, six hour bundle now become our one bundle because you what we want to tell you that sepsis is something that life threatening can be reversed hundred percent. And we need to start something fast. 
it's like a like like our F one race, yeah. So, um, however, now I will go into the sepsis, uh, the hour one bundle recommendation. Just now we talked about the lactate two, uh, two must be uh, documented in our BBG or ABG or lactate level in any lab result, yeah. Okay, for administration of antibiotic, I want to highlight something here. Everybody know about antibiotic. Everybody know need to start antibiotic, and everybody know want to give antibiotic immediately. I think yesterday I have seen our hospital compliance of uh, antibiotic given in outside ICU. Uh, we have ninety four percent compliance of antibiotic according to antibiogram um, antibiogram uh, uh, recommendation of our hospital uh, chancellor Tongku Mukris. Very well done for our hospital that can achieve ninety four percent of uh, compliance of. Uh, the protocol, antibody protocol. Yeah? So we need to give an early broad spectrum, not a narrow, it's early because we're covered as much as possible. But later on, when we have the CNS, we have to narrow down to the pathogen identification and also discontinuation of the decision. Okay, this was, uh, uh, I think all hospitals have antimicrobial stewardship uh, committee. I think our committee here, very, very good. I, I very salute them. And they had come to see a patient that um, when to need to discontinue the antibiotic. Why? We want to reduce the antibiotic misuse and antibiotic resistance. This was, must be done, yeah? Even though we want to start empirical, we need to discontinue if the decision is not infection anymore. And the treatment should be seven to 10 days. Not three, not four, not five, it's seven to 10 days. Uh, this is an interesting uh, study. Uh, because we, we, recommend, we recommend early antibiotics uh, to administrate uh, administration to a patient in sepsis. This group of people, uh, our, our scientists here, um, is uh, from uh, Nadia et al. They, they want to try to see whether if they give antibiotic pre-hospital, meaning that they go to the ambulance call, they go out and they see a patient ill, they straight away give antibiotic there. And, and compared with the other group who come to ED, and then they give, an, uh, give antibiotic as usual, and they found out that there's no any difference between too early to give the antibiotic and too late to get the antibiotic. This is within one hour because the mean is about less than two hours. Yeah. However, um, there is study uh, saying that after six hours, if we delay the antibiotic administration more than six hours, patient mortality will increase uh, according to the timing. More than six hours, definitely more mortality. So consideration of antibiotic is very important because that is not only the sensitivity that makes sense and makes an important. Sensitivity is just to make sure that antibiotics are working and also reduce the, uh, our bacterial resistance. However, we still need to consider uh, those patients who are critical ill, especially who admitted to ICU, in emergency, who are in the resuscitation zone. They are very unstable hemodynamic, whereby, whereby um, our... our and when the hemodynamic unstable, the perfusion of the tissue is not good. The antibiotic won't reach to the our whole every part of the body, especially those infected part. Yeah, so we have to consider this. Number two, we have to because of increased cardiac output, our clearance of the blood spectrum antibiotic can be very fast, um, uh, reduce the efficacy, and also we have to inc uh, have to reduce have to consider extracellular volume, whereby the patient is already edematous, the antibiotic won't reach the tissue. And also the kidney function, hepatic function may be not normal compared with the patient who are, are not ill. And also I want to highlight serum albumin less than 30. Serum albumin, hypoalbumin actually will really cause our antibiotic um, efficacy. Why? Let me show you next slide. This is um, a simple, uh, simple audit from uh, simple knowledge on antibiotic prescription. Yeah? You see, high bound protein antibiotic is this least and moderate bound protein is this and min minimum bound is this. So for a patient with hypoalbumin, if we start the high protein bound antibiotic, such as like rosafine, which is the uh, septriazone, or erythromycin or amphotericin, it either the whatever we give to the patient with hypoalbumin, uh, they will have, uh, because the uh, hypoalbumin, they didn't, uh, the patient dosing will be reduced because it will clearance very, the antibiotic will clear very fast, the dose may be not enough. So in a, in a patient who are critical ill, malnutrition, hypoalbumin, those high bound antibiotics, either you want to choose a low bound or moderate bound, or you change, increase the dosing of the yes, like uh, our septriazone, you can do to BD dose, to 3DS, TDS dose. But 
majority of us didn't look into this. Uh, I think this is a very, very big big fall. That's why you sometimes you see why the antibiotic was not responding. The sensitivity is good, it's correct, but it's still not responding. Maybe you have looked into this hypoalbumin thing. Hypoalbumin of 30 milligram per deciliter will cause the uh, the cause the antibiotic level subtherapeutic. So we either you want to replace the albumin for that patient, increase high protein diet, or change the anti antibiotic or increase the dosing of antibiotic. So 45 for your information, 45, 40 to 50 percent of all this uh, patient critical evasion is hypoalbumin. Yeah? So don't don't worry about giving patient IV albumin, even though that is a bit. Uh, there's no controversy at all uh, because there's a lot of studies saying that the albumin is safe for human. Yeah? And also a patient edematous patient also can be reduced by albumin. Okay, let me go into more, um, share with you more insight about the success, uh, success uh, shock resuscitation. Now I'm talking about the stroke volume. Okay, so we want to resuscitate the patient's stroke volume, but definitely we will give an intravenous uh, crystalloid. Uh, there is a lot of controversy about controversial about the 30 mil per kilo intravenous crystalloid boluses. So the recommendation for our one now, our one bundle now is actually you need to initiate the 30 mil per kilo boluses for those only hypotension or let it more than four within the first hour, but to complete within three hour. And also they have actually one more, one more recommendation is with proper monitoring, with a monitoring too. Yeah. And this was uh, especially this was not applied. This was not applied, even though the patient hypertension and lactic more than four for cardiac cardiogenic origin, the patient got cardiac failure, and set renal failure, and also lung pathology like COAG patient, lung parenchyma diseases or chronic lung disease, yeah. Right, so for the crystalloid, uh, we or balance align, uh, definitely balance align is best because it will favor to uh, uh, increase the uh, lactic clearance as well as reduce the mortality. Uh, there is also a study, uh, the same study saying the albumin for four percent actually added added to the crystalloid can improve the survival rate. Yeah, so what now I would like to take, tell, uh, share with you the pitfall of the intravenous fluid. Uh, it doesn't matter um, the boat. Uh, okay, we, before we start our fluid resuscitate, we need to consider these five things. These five things, yeah? The first thing is the type of fluid definitely is not colloid. It's only crystalloid that we recommended or albumin 4% or albumin 20%. Uh, and also we recommended the volume of the fluid. The volume of fluid have to be considered patient uh, 30 mils per bolus, slow over three hours or one hour. And cardiac reserve kidney function, we need to look into that. We need to do an echo if let's say we have it or we or either we use another way. I will, I will share with you another way, uh, non-invasive way to do a cardiac reserve a checking. And also the kidney function uh, from the blood test. We also sometimes, and I would like to highlight these two things, the intravascular oncotic pressure, which was not really mentioned in the, uh, the protocol and uh, our consideration. If the patient has hypo, uh, pre-existing hypoalbumin, let's say the level is less than 30, yeah, and we run bolus of 30 mil per kilo, later on patient will have ex, uh, extravascular exvasation and cause edema and cause uh, non-infective non uh, management um, of the patient. Yeah? So oncotic pressure uh, pertaining to the albumin level is important. That's why a normal albumin level more than 30 is important before you start the fluid. If not, you have to choose other fluid that is suitable, which is like albumin 4% or maybe uh, uh, albumin 20% with uh, boluses, uh, calculated dose. Like, yeah? okay. I also I want to highlight this glycocalyx um, system. Glycocalyx system is like a gel. Uh, I will share to you how, later on. Okay. So um, albumin, uh, how safe is albumin? There's multiple study that's saying that the albumin is very safe for human uh, intravenously for patients in sepsis. Even they have a better... Um, better outcome if you use albumin early. They can significantly reduce the dying of 18 mortality, significantly reduce it eh, for the albumin treated patient in present of severe success group, meaning that the patient for, al for albumin group patient uh, who have organ failure, they are, have, they are protective, yeah, 0 0.88. And also for this meta-analysis, uh, SEAL et al. also comments that uh, albumin should use to result in reduced septic shock in 19 day mortality. Can you see that? It's very safe profile and even they have reduced 90 days mortality. Albio trial. Albio trial is 2014 
and also use 20% uh, albumin plus crystalloid. They target the albumin more than 30 versus the crystalloid alone for seven days in ICU. And also they found out that prostatic shock is protective, meaning that albumin have reduced the mortality for a patient in 90 days. Yeah? So albumin really, really good for survival rate. And we recommend, this is my recommended dose. If you have a 25% albumin, if you don't have a 4% albumin, you can dilute in this way, 4 mil per, 4 mil albumin for 25% or 5 mil uh, albumin for 20%. Yeah? To, uh, so you can give in a separate dose in a very uh, mon uh, close monitoring to achieve uh, 30 gram per deciliter. Uh, from our experience that we use a lot of uh, quite a quite a long time albumin for 25 percent in our emergency department uh, for the last three years we didn't have any complications and also uh, a lot of patients have respond well uh, we can achieve like achieve increase of uh, about ranging from five to ten yeah five to ten gram per deciliter uh, albumin in the blood per bolus yeah per bolus of this so maybe we need to have established a better you know a gauge uh, to see how much albumin that we can give how much in albumin we in give intravenously can increase how many uh, gram per deciliter uh, gram per liter of uh, albumin in the blood so i will talk about the systemic vascular resistance uh, this uh, was recommended by the one hour one bundle to start vasopressor during the after flight everybody know this and i think no no ad is the first choice and it counter vasopressor yeah? However, this is the pick four that I want to share with you. How much is enough? Yeah, we need to tell. We need to know that. Yeah, patient who have sepsis, the volume, the volume actually, uh, there's two components. One is our intravenous volume enough or not? We call it preload, and the afterload, which is the vascular tone, that really matter, uh, that contribute to the uh, our me, uh, our MAP, yeah, our blood pressure. However, when we start no adrenaline, definitely significantly we will increase the vascular tone of the patient to, to, to counteract the vasopagic caused by the cytokine. However, how much that uh, no act should be started to squeeze the vessel? We should understand that we do want a patient who has over squeeze uh, vasoconstriction artery that cause a poor perfusion to the periphery or not enough that the vasotone was not really counteract. We want a normal size artery that to maintain a good perfusion. Meaning that if you want to start the no act dose, you need to make sure that you can achieve the normal uh, diameter of our normal artery. You don't want them to be very squeezed, uh, very constricted artery to get your blood pressure. Yeah, you will see the blood pressure very nicely stable, you know, but however, patient perfusion is not good. However, for the dilated, uh, for, for the uh, for the dilated, uh, you use too low, too low, no act, the perfusion will be poor as well because of too vasodilate, uh, DP will know. So, uh, usually I recommend uh, zero, if you have a no act of uh, infusion of 0 0.3 mic and above, I think you need to counter check again your fluid is enough or not. Because um, sepsis patients uh, have temperature, insensible loss, they are really easy to have loss of fluid very fast. And their third spray loss also quite uh, significant, uh, can cause a, uh, hypovolemia. So uh, when you have to increase your NOAD infusion more than 0 0.3 mic per kilo per hour, please recheck your free status. Don't keep on increase the uh, NOAD that actually they will harm the patient because you squeeze the vessel and cause the heart to pump hard, difficult to pump. Yeah. Okay, for NC, now I talk about this controversial, uh, controversial um, uh, medication. But NSAID traditionally is good. Traditionally is for to use to calm down our inflammation. This is very safe for an early infection, meaning that patients who have early sepsis that have the evidence of systemic vascular resistance, um, vasoplegic, yeah? NSAID can help you to calm down the cytokine storm. Uh, our ex, uh, some of the study use aspirin, some study use NSAID, you see they're protective, they're protective, and also they use, uh, they reduce the in-hospital mortality for sepsis. Later on, I can show you the list. How NSAID do? NSAID is by redu reducing the inflammation, uh, reducing the cytokine, or they moderate the cytokine. And, and the cytokine, which lead to the vasodilatation now, is uh, eliminated by NSAID. So the vasodilatation will be reduced. Yeah? So NSAID, you, you cannot use prolonged. You only can use single, or single dose 
uh, one dose, you know, stack dose, or maybe repeated another time, one more dose to reduce the inflammation. We don't want the patient uh, inflammation was uh, uh, totally diminished. We want a gentle, 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 sorry, gentle inflammation, yeah, gentle inflammation. So NSAID can come down a bit of cytokine storm. And believe me, if you have use, you are in, keep on increasing the no adrenaline, uh, uh, that our, we cannot control the vascular tone, the blood pressure still keep on reducing. Uh, maybe a dose of NSAID can reduce the use of NOAD and reverse the NOAD faster than without NSAID. Yeah? But precaution, you have to make sure that the kidney is okay, the kidney position is okay, and the liver is okay. And also the blood parameter is okay. And there is no gastric ulcer. So this is all the study that uh, talk about NSAID and also aspirin and so anti agent, increased uh, protective, protective oil. As, uh, uh, this is aspirin, anti statin, and also indomethacin. So glycocalic, glycocalic is like a jelly that is lining on the, our capillary. Uh, in, this is the recent finding that uh, this is a capillary. We have this small cilia. Actually, it's like our agar-agar, the gel, uh, the, 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 we call it the jelly. This jelly uh, protect the leakage, uh, protect all this protein not to stick on the wall that don't cause thrombose and don't cross the atherospec. However, when in inflammation, the cytokine will attack this membrane and then become make this part thinner. When it thinner, when it thinner, you see all this protein. This is the agarpoclase. Uh, that's a gel. When the cytokine destroy this gel, this uh, all this cytokine will attack our wall and cause hyperpermeability. This hyperpermeability cause extravasation and cause, especially in dengue, eh? dengue and COVID maybe, and other sepsis patients, they have this leaky, leaky vessel. So, sorry, uh, I go back to the viewers. For, for how, to, how, to, how to manage this is that you have NSAID, intravascular, uh, intravenous uh, albumin, actually can restore this, this uh, layer, eh? NSAID, in uh, albumin, in uh, human albumin, and as well as steroid can re can repair this, yeah, repair this. So it helps in the sense of uh, reduce the leaking of, especially in dengue. Yeah? Okay, prophylactic uh, platelet transfusion is only for less than ten thousand absent of pa parents and twenty thousand significant risk and fifty thousand for active bleeding. Yeah, Glycocalyx actually was uh, will be reduced. Uh, there are, Glycocalyx damage will be reduced by avoiding the hypovolemia. hypovolemia. You don't give so much of fluid into a patient, it will wash out the jelly. And also hyperglycemic, also it will wash, it will destroy, it will cause this layer be uh, uh, destroyed. And also cytokine. Uh, to maintain physiological concentration of plasma protein, particular albumina. Albumin is important to maintain this uh, glycocalyx uh, layer. And steroid found to be good to reduce the glycocalyx. Uh, Glycocalyx are destroyed, and also uh, we have to look into this and also NSAID actually. Yeah? So, how much is enough? I talked about the no act is 0 0.3 mic. So, we talk about cardiac contractility. The cardiac contractility, um, we can assess by using ultrasound, we can use, use PLAT, we can use a lot of invasive method. The first line that we want to use is dobutamine. No worry about um, the first line we want to start is 5 to 10 mic yeah? because. If you assess the cardiac quantity is not good, a 5 to 10 mic is enough to give the best optimum cardiac output. If you go beyond 15, uh, it will depress the cardiac function. You can base on the dopamine stress test. If um, we use got stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, for, stage 4 for dopamine stress test for cardiac assessment. Uh, stage 1 is no dopamine. Stage 2 dopamine 5 to 10 mic. The third stage is 15 mic. And the uh, fourth stage, it go back to normal. So, uh, the third stage actually stress the patient, which is 15 mic. So for my suggestion is that you only would like to start 5 to 10. If you increase more than 10, meaning that the heart won't give you the a more additional, you know, additional function. It's just that we make the heart pump faster and cause the heart easier fail. Uh, more, more faster to push the heart failure. Uh, and also remember, if you start to more than 10 mic, you need to give, you need to look into other parameter, other parameter, yeah? Echo, echo can give you to look into a septic cardiomyopathy. If let's say you don't have echo, you can give a dose of uh, 10 mil of bolus of calcium gluconate. If the blood pressure increased, meaning that the cardiac contractility actually impaired. So we look into oxygenation. Oxygenation, uh, usually we look into lactate. Lactate high level, lactate is due to hypoxia. 
low lactic is uh, more than two is hypoxia, yeah, and also early clearance can be uh, can reduce the our mortality as well as the RBC. We need to look into hemoglobin. The gram must be if less than seven, we need to transfer lah. Huh? We against use of fresh frozen uh, frozen uh, fresh frozen plasma to correct clotting abnormality because because that time maybe patient already have the IBC. We have to look into the IBC regime, not only FF, FFP only, yeah. And we look into the hormones. Hormones are uh, very important. Hormones is a two H swap, yeah, a swap with two H. Hormone can be high dose, can be low dose, yeah. Uh, in the stage, this is important when you need to know the patient hyperinflammation state or hypoinflammation state. Uh, in a patient with static shock, usually we have this a transient pseudo pan hypoperturism, or maybe we can call it uh, like adrenal insufficiency, especially in car state. Yeah? This, state uh, this type of patient, we need a low dose of hormones, uh, especially hydrocorts, to support their cortisol level, which is already depleted. We just need to top up their steroid to maintain a good inflammation. Compare with those inserts, uh, we might need a little bit higher dose of uh, septic, uh, meaning that the septic shock with uh, very uh, cytokine storm cause the septic shock. You might need a higher dose of uh, hormone, which is like 100 milligram dose, a stack dose, to suppress a bit of the hyperinflammation so that uh, the, the patient has a smoother inflammation and don't, co uh, don't go into shock space. Um, and if let's say, if you're already given, uh, you have to consider those hypoperfusion um, patient with low dose, yeah? And remember, this group patient is low dose. Okay, this is the golden, this is the most important key that I want to mention, which is overlooked by a lot, a lot of us. So, ATP, what is ATP means? ATP is the what is the fundamentals of all the cell living uh, activities. So, ATP is low, nothing can function, right? So ATP, how you know that we cannot measure ATP actively? We cannot, all right? And also, I talk about glucose because glucose and convert into pyruvate and then make ATP for us to the cell to function. Blood vessel need ATP to vasoconstrict. Heart need ATP to pump. The uh, our muscle need ATP to work. Yeah. However, if the patient have hypoglycemia, low glucose. Remember, I talk about this hypoglycemic is not in the blood, but in the cell, intracellular hypoglycemia, which is not able to me measure in any machine now. We're talking about blood, eh, but evoked by the intravenous or intra-arterial glucose level. It's just an evocation. Eh? So if let's say low sugar, low ATP, your whatever resuscitation you put in, useless because the cell cannot react to your drug that you give, like no air, no vitamin, the antibiotic won't work because the ATP low. Cell will die, yeah? So how we going to do it? We need to know that the patient ATP is good or not. Look into the patient immune uh, response to resuscitation or not. If not, look into sugar, yeah? Okay. Glucose, uh, pick for glucose. For a sepsis patient, we need a eight to 10, yeah? eight to 10 millimole to be normal for a septic shock and sepsis patient. If less than eight is considered hypoglycemic, I repeat again, less than eight is hypoglycemia for a septic or critical ill patient. So if any patient who are lactic, uh, our glucose load lower than eight, you need to give sugar. Eh? If you're not, not convinced about this, you can do a serum ketone. If let's say the glucose is so low, uh, ketone should be high because patient is starving, right? So we can do a blood serum ketone. If it's more than 0 0.5, it associates with patient uh, storage glucose storage in the cell is low. That patient need insulin, uh, need the glucose. However, we, if you give sugar, you also have to consider insulin. Insulin is the problem that uh, when patient is in a static shock, patient is hypoproteinemia, insulin will be low. If there's no insulin, whatever we give in intravenous uh, dextrose will not go into the cell. So we need to consider to initiate uh, glucose boluses. Uh, and look into the uh, our lactic train trend. Yeah, lactic less than two. Okay, maybe I talk about a bit of focus and fructose uh, things. So how how the lactic low? Before that, I talk about. Uh, okay, let me go back. Why the lactic is low? Remember, the lactic lows is because of I show you this picture. If the lactic is high, high, because of uh, we have a lot of uh, glucose in the cell, but we have oxygen level low, then anaerobic we cause lactate high because hypoperfusion. 
Lactate very low, but you can see some of the patients very low, less than one. Actually, the cell don't have glucose even to react. They cannot even go into anaerobic because of low sugar level in the cell. So this is even worse. Patient in, especially patient in critical ill and malnutrition, they cannot have a good, they cannot mount the lactic level. And this patient is actually have no nutrition at all. Yeah. And that's why I'm talking about the metabolic syndrome and also fructose, because our major food now a day is contained of sucrose, which is fructose and glucose in combination. And fructose is not able to, uh, it's only being digested in the liver, but not in the tissue. Uh, and also we cannot use fructose direct, directly to get ATP. Glucose in vice versa, glucose can give you ATP directly into the cell. However, because when we ingest the sucrose, it's together with fructose and glucose actually, so fructose ingested will suppress our insulin production and also it su suppress our leptin hormone. So what happened to uh, these two? If you suppress the insulin, whatever that you eat inside the body, fructose and uh, the sugar will surge in the intravascular region, but however, they didn't go into the cell because the fructose suppressed the insulin, right? So it created a, a, a pseudo-starving stage for our cell. Fructose actually cause uh, like starving, yeah? And also the uh, and actually we created the intracellular hypoglycemic with normal serum uh, glucose level or normal or higher uh, glucose level in the serum. Uh, this is a fake. This is uh, this hyperglycemic actually is a fake uh, picture or pseudo picture of uh, presentation of the patient. Yeah, we have hundred percent fructose fruit nowadays. So this is very important. Fructose also suppress the leptin and cause hunger and intake food more and more, and this created the metabolic syndrome. So when a patient with metabolic syndrome, he look he's well well look like very well nourished. Actually, they are starving all the while because of ATP fructose. Or they ingest a lot of fructose and cause it, uh, the cell. Uh, don't have the glucose reserve and cause ATP low. Huh? And metabolic syndrome is very, very hard and very difficult to manage because they need, you need to give a lot, a lot of, you still have to start insulin plus sugar infusion to make sure, I, I call it a power, power bank cocktail, huh? glucose and insulin is a power bank cocktail. It's like a power bank for handphone. Uh, if you don't have this power bank cocktail, whatever the five steps that I said, the, the, the volume, the cardiac contractility, the vascular tone, all this will not react. So this is the fundamental of resuscitation. If you can resuscitate this ATP, everything will go well. Yeah? That's why you, don't, you wonder why refractory, this is what the reason is. So low lactic is the new things that you need to look into. Low lactic is because of our patient starving, because of our normal diet now. So their sugar is not normal. We didn't take dextrose anymore, but we take so much of fructose that created a pseudo starving and cell reserve is low. And this created a low lactic for the patient and indicate that they have poor nutrition and they will have a very bad condition. Yeah? And, also for, um, and also for this insulin, remember to start insulin if you want to give sugar. But just be careful when you want to start insulin, just make sure that patient have a higher level of sugar, meaning more than 10, only you start insulin. If patient can have, you can give a simple test. Huh? This is what I, I, I share with my students sometimes. If you know that, you don't know whether our insulin uh, enough or not for a patient. Uh, because some of now today we have this um, uh, diabetic patient, uh, it's on insulin injection or patient with uh, poor insulin sensitivity. Yeah? We're not sure the insulin function is good and we don't have tested insulin level in the lab. So what we do is that if you see a patient with a low lactate, Okay, and low sugar, you give a dose of glucose 50 mil, 50%, and see, observe in half an hour time whether the lactic level go up or not. If lactic level go up or not, means that your hypoxia is creating the anaerobic, means that the cell have enough glucose to create the lactic. Okay, then the insulin of this patient is enough. However, if the patient, after you give one bolus of sugar, sugar go up, but the lactic is still the same low, that means that the cell cannot receive, didn't receive the glucose into the cell. So means that patients have insulin depletion. So that time you can start your insulin. This is a simple test for you to look into. And you can use ketone to advocate this. If the ketone high become lower after you give sugar, meaning that the insulin is good. Last is to establish our nutrition, early establish. And also uh, uh, nutrition, uh, sorry. You have to start feeding in the emergency department after the six hour of uh, resuscitation. You have to start now, yeah? Okay, this is a summary of today's talk. Uh, so um, when you have a patient with sepsis, uh, you determine the, the sepsis already and you determine whether which state are they in. 
you can initially start the sepsis hour bundle, one hour bundle, hour bun bundle by giving antibiotic, mesolactic, and fluid pressure pressure. After that, it go into the personal therapy. What if the patient in such state, you have to give some suppressive, eh, suppressive and nutrition support. Means that you even consider a dose of steroid, hyperinflammation, and you can consider NSAID, you can consider uh, to look into the hypoglyc uh, the glycocalyx. And also for those who are uh, who are come into mass or cast is cold, patient very hypoinflammation, you need to give supportive nutrition. Supportive meaning that give low dose of steroid replace whatever they have, and also give antibiotic and correct their albumin. Correct their albumin. I talk about it. correct the albumin again. And also early enteric feeding and keep the sugar eight to ten. Eight to ten always. Yeah. And take home message. This is again, I repeat this slide for you to remember this. And also this is algorithm if you suspect an infection. You need to score either at triage using the QQ sofa and ER or not ICU, use the M sofa. If you are in ICU, use uh, sofa score or you want to use Apathy score and determine the whole dysregulated response, either SIRS, CAS, mass space. Maybe we can share a bit more later or you can look into my old PowerPoint. And also, if no, then we consider patient's infection, not sepsis. If lactic more than two and low, BP low is go to septic shock, not low is go to sepsis. Yeah? And I repeat again, this is a concept of resuscitation. And this is a slide again. So uh, we have created a chart like this, easy for us to use in ED, but this is just uh, just help us to monitor our patients. So we, you can have your M sofa here, the sofa score is here, and then the chart is here. And also we can check what stage our patient in, what type of uh, our inflammation. And this chart will be shared by the next slide, uh, next uh, talk. And we have this book, and you can have a look on this, you can contact me. And also we have this online ebook. This is uh, our, our 2D. Maybe later on we can share again in the in the website. Yeah, uh, you can or, or you can go to this website www.mysepsis.org to get all this information. Thank you. I will pass back to our host.